Steve Bannon guilty of two counts of contempt of Congress. Let's talk about that because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So Steve Bannon's criminal contempt of Congress case took a full week to try. And yet the jury needed less than three hours to find him guilty. That's not just a verdict, that's a statement. I mean, they barely had enough time to begin their deliberations, select the four person, start surveying the evidence. They even fit in a lunch during that less than three hours. Then they returned to the courtroom and announced guilty on count one, guilty on count two, one count for willfully defying a congressional subpoena for documents, and a second count for willfully defying a congressional subpoena for testimony. Now let me say, I watched the whole trial and the prosecutors, Assistant United States Attorney uh, Molly Gaston and Assistant United States Attorney Amanda Vaughn did a remarkable job. The American people were well represented and they deserve our gratitude. They had so many great lines in their closing and rebuttal arguments, but I'm just going to cite a few. AUSA Gaston opened her closing argument by saying, this case is not complicated, but it is important. It's about a man, this man, pointing to Steve Bannon, this man who didn't show up. Government only works if people show up. Government only works if people play by the rules and if people are held accountable when they don't. That's how AUSA Gaston opened her initial closing argument. As you may know, in criminal trials, the prosecution gives its initial closing argument, the defense then gives its closing argument, and then the prosecutors get the last word in what's called rebuttal argument to rebut the arguments that were made by the defense. Why? Why does the prosecution get two bites of the apple? Because the prosecution has the burden of proving guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, the highest burden known to the law. So they get the last word. And AUSA Vaughn gave just what I thought was a genius rebuttal argument. Um, I'm not going to recount much of it, but when Steve Bannon tried to suggest to the jurors during the course of the trial, even though Steve Bannon didn't testify, shocking, looks like we found a way to quiet Steve Bannon, just tell him, oh, you want to talk, you're going to be placed under oath and you have to tell the truth. You're not going to hear a peep from that dude. He didn't testify. They didn't call any witnesses. They didn't present any evidence. They put on no defense case, but they tried to suggest all sorts of things. Like after he willfully defied the subpoenas, refused to appear, refused to uh, pro produce the documents he was lawfully required to produce, he made all sorts of half-baked arguments like maybe the dates for the subpoena were flexible. Maybe they weren't really fixed. Maybe I was still negotiating with them, or maybe I kind of had some executive privilege that was lingering that gives me an out. And here is what Assistant United States uh, Attorney Vaughn said about all of those ridiculous arguments. Steve Bannon is like a child arguing with a parent after he's been grounded. Steve Bannon's conduct is the very definition of contempt. Yes, the prosecutors did a terrific job and a just verdict was reached. So what happens now? Well, the judge set a sentencing date for October 21st. Let's talk about Steve Bannon's criminal exposure on these two convictions. Each conviction carries with it a maximum prison term of one year, but 
each conviction also carries with it a mandatory minimum time in jail of 30 days. So the judge has no discretion. For openers, the judge must impose at least 30 days on each of those two convictions. Okay, so does that mean 60 days total? Maybe, maybe not. Because when you have multiple convictions in one case, the judge has a decision to make. Does he or she run the sentences um, consecutive to one another, one on top of another? So you do the 30, the first 30, then you do the second 30 for a total of 60, or does the judge run, run them concurrent, run them together? So you can actually serve both mandatory minimum 30-day sentences at the same time. That's gonna be up to the discretion of the judge, and I have a feeling the prosecutors will urge the court to punish him separately, consecutively, because there are two rights to be vindicated. One for failing to present the documents, the evidence that was lawfully subpoenaed, and a second to vindicate the, um, the, uh, the second subpoena, to provide testimony. We'll see what the judge does. So if I had to offer some of my informed speculation, given what I know of the criminal justice system, having practiced in the courts of DC for decades, I would say the judge will land on, a, on an aggregate sentence, a total sentence that is somewhere between six months and one year in prison, but it could be as much as two years. It could be as little as 30 days. I don't think the judge will go that low. But there are some important takeaways from today's conviction of Steve Bannon for thumbing his nose at congressional subpoenas. It's now pretty clear that there are consequences. Congressional subpoenas are not party invitations. If you defy them, you may very well find yourself in prison. And that is as it should be, because government only works if people show up. And if they don't, if they're held accountable for not showing up, as Assistant United States Attorney Gaston argued so eloquently. Okay, the second topic that I want to take on very briefly is um, last night's January 6th committee public hearings. And if you'll permit me, I'm going to cheat a little bit on this video because um, I'll, full disclosure, uh, today was a long day. Uh, started out with my first appearance at 7 a.m. at the courthouse all day, standing in 95 degree heat outside doing periodic updates on MSNBC during the course of the day. And the day's not over because I'll be joining Lawrence O'Donnell tonight, not complaining, just explaining why I'm a little bit, um, a little bit tired and I'm going to cheat a little bit. And what I mean by that is I did a video first thing this morning, a very short video on my main takeaway from last night's January 6th public hearing. Um, so I wanna play that for you right now. It's only about a minute in length, and then we'll talk on the other side of this clip. Well, I'm about to head back to Federal District Court in DC for closing arguments in the Steve Bannon case, and I'll bring you updates over the course of the day, but if you'll indulge me for just one minute, I have to comment on some of what I saw in last night's January 6th public hearings, because the picture that was painted of what Donald Trump did in those three plus hours while the Capitol was under attack, while people were being hurt and killed, is chilling. And here's what it reminded me of. The Situation Room in the White House, that is where the president and high executive branch officials will gather in moments of national emergency, national crisis, when action has to be taken when a situation has to be monitored. You probably remember the iconic photo of President Obama, then Vice President Biden, and the high executive branch officials monitoring the raid to try to take out Osama bin Laden. The picture that has now emerged of what Donald Trump was doing during our moment of dire national crisis, when our democratic process was under violent attack, is he was sitting in a private dining room, a presidential dining room, watching the attack gleefully on Fox News, refusing to call it off, refusing to send 
law enforcement or military reinforcements to the capital to protect the lives of the people in the capital, to protect the peaceful transition of power, to protect our very democracy. During those three plus hours, Donald Trump was not the leader of the country. Donald Trump was the leader of the coup. And for that, he needs to be held accountable. Now. So that's my main takeaway. On January 6th, Donald Trump was not the leader of the country. He was the leader of the coup. And indictments better be just around the corner. Because justice matters. And friends, as always, thank you for tuning in to these daily Justice Matters videos. As you may know, we're an all-volunteer operation here at Justice Matters. We're up and running seven days a week, posting a legal analysis video every day. Uh, if you'd like to more formally support our efforts, our mission, our content, please feel free to come on over to patreon.com. You can sign up to become a patron. And if you do, I will send you some Team Justice and Justice Matters stickers and a personal handwritten note of thanks. And thank you, thank you to the many of you who have decided to come over to patreon.com, support our efforts, our mission, and our content. We could not do this without you, so thank you. And as always, friends, please stay safe, please stay tuned, and I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.